Good morning. We are going to start this morning with general questions. Our first question from Mark MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure that children with complex needs and medical conditions are appropriately supported in their education. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, we want all children and young people to be able to make the most of their educational opportunities. Education authorities have duties under the Additional Support for Learning Act 2001 to identify, provide for and review the additional support needs of all of their pupils. This includes ensuring that there is appropriate resources in place to support pupils in their learning. This is supplemented by specific guidance on meeting the healthcare needs of pupils whilst they are attending school and supporting children who are unable to attend school due to ill health. Mark MacDonald. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. The prevalence of children with life-limiting conditions in Scotland is increasing and these children are surviving longer, meaning that many schools are now encountering complex medical conditions which previously had not been the case. While the new guidance to which the Cabinet Secretary has alluded addresses the issue of liability falling on individual staff members supporting people's health care needs, there is a question as to whether it addresses the specific needs of children who require, who require enteral feeding or medication. Given that the prevalence of children who may require tube feeding or medication may increase in future, is the Cabinet Secretary willing to explore whether more specific guidance may be required and would he be willing to meet with me to discuss this further? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, I'm very happy to explore that uh, issue further. It's a very specialist set of circumstances. I uh, understand, having visited a number of educational facilities that are providing support to young people um, who require um, a feeding through a tube, that they um, of the complexities and the challenges that that presents uh, and obviously in a mainstream school environment that can be a, a particularly acute challenge but I'm very happy to meet with Mr Macdonald and to hear his views on how we might, may have more focused guidance that might help educational practitioners in this respect. And Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of press reports regarding inappropriate restraint at Clyde, Value, Va Clyde View School in my constituency. Can I have assurance from the Cabinet Secretary that concerns regarding restraint, as highlighted by the Children's Commissioner Bruce Adamson in the report Restraint and Seclusion in Scotland Schools, are being addressed? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, I am aware of the reports to which uh, Claire Adamson refers, and obviously um, these are issues which have been drawn to the attention of the North Lanarkshire Council, who I would say have been uh, very uh, open in their uh, uh, supplying information to the government in this respect. Uh, North Lancashire Council are investigating this incident and it is also the subject of a police in uh, Scotland investigation. So it would be inappropriate for me to comment any further on the circumstances of the Clyde View case. Um, in general, however, I would say that the, uh, the government's guidance on the use of restraint is absolutely crystal clear that the, the use of restraint should only ever be used as a last resort after all other interventions have been exhausted and only in circumstances where the safety of members of staff or the child concerned would be, um, would be uh, supported um, as a consequence of restraint. But I stress that is only in the most um, a limited set of circumstances when all other avenues of positive intervention have been exhausted. Question number two, Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of further delays in reopening Hunterston Nuclear Power Station, what discussions it has had with the Office for Nuclear Regulation to ensure that it will not be allowed to, open, to reopen unless safety standards are met? Minister Paul Wheelhouse. I met with senior representatives from the Office for Nuclear Regulation, uh, ONR, on the 21st of February 2019. Uh, the purpose of the meeting was to discuss the current situation at Hunterston B and the processes uh, ONR will use to make a decision regarding a possible restart of the reactors. While the ONR is not directly accountable to Scottish ministers, the ONR representatives provided assurance that it is willing only uh, to allow for the reactors to restart if it's satisfied it's safe to do so and that it's functioning in an independent and transparent manner. Ross Greer. I thank the Minister for that answer. As you'll be aware, there are 370 cracks in the reactor core at Hunterston B. This is a significant safety concern for the community and for workers. This is a nuclear power plant that has been repeatedly closed due to safety concerns. Its reopening has been repeatedly delayed. And regardless of all of that, it's one whose lifespan will not go beyond 2023. For the workers and the community, this is a huge concern. Will the Minister and will the Scottish Government commit to ensuring that there is a just transition for every single worker currently 
currently employed or connected to nuclear uh, power at Hunterston? Minister. Um, uh, certainly, in, in regards to uh, Ross Greer's question, I could just uh, clarify that um, the checks have found 100 cracks, but there's an estimate that there's 370. So we don't know precisely how many cracks there are in the reactor, and I think that's just uh, a, point of, a point of fact to, to put across. It's worth stating that um, clearly, uh, as I've, I said in my original answer, the uh, future of the reactors themselves are a matter for the ONR to, to engage on uh, with, with EDF, the operator, and of course we're not directly accountable uh, to, to Scottish Parliament or Scottish Government on, on those matters. We have uh, obviously an interest in the well-being of the community in North Ayrshire. That um, is, uh, is obviously the plant employs many people in, the, in, in that community and we'll do everything we can to support them. But I, I do not want to prejudge the outcome of the exercise. We have to let the ONR do its work and I trust their judgment on, on the matter. Uh, but they have given us every assurance that safety, health and safety is their primary concern. But of course we will help if there's any implications for the plant itself. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Minister agree that Hunterson B operates within stringent safety limits and the EDF is regularly in contact with the Office for Nuclear Regulation regarding graphite cracks and other safety-related matters. Having visited Hunterson B last week and spoken to EDF, it's clear that safety is an absolute overriding concern of all who work there. Their own lives and those of their families living in nearby communities depends upon it. Minister. I, I certainly um, I agree with uh, Kenneth Gibson. I mean, in, in respect of the workforce, I have to say public safety is obviously uh, the Scottish Government's absolute priority and clearly uh, our position on the future of nuclear energy is, is well known, uh, that we are not minded to, to support that. But from the interaction I and my officials have had with the Office for Nuclear Regulation themselves and indeed EDF staff at Hunterston uh, B itself as the plant, it is clear that the health and safety is absolutely their priority. And it's worth stating also that the ONR, when I did meet with them, were uh, keen to stress that in their view, the workforce at Hunterston is one of the best they've ever come across in terms of the quality of the work they do and they have absolutely no concerns about their, their skills or abilities and if, indeed if there are problems at Hunterston B it's around the technology itself not the workforce. Question number three Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. To ask the Cabinet Secretary what the Scottish Government's position is regarding whether schools should have a zero tolerance policy towards violent behaviour. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. So violence towards anyone is unacceptable and the safety of our children, young people and staff at school is paramount. We and our partners across the education sector advocate an approach for schools and local authorities to work with pupils on the underlying reasons behind inappropriate behaviour to enable them to re-engage with learning and personal development. We have published guidance for schools and local authorities which has a renewed focus on prevention, early intervention and response to individual need in line with the principles of getting it right for every child. Michelle Ballantyne. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, I've recently been contacted by a teacher who has 30 years experience and is currently working as a supply teacher who was actually hospitalised after a metal implement was thrown and damaged her eye. Violence in schools is causing teachers to think twice about their careers and certainly we're struggling now when we learn at Christmas that over £60 million has now been spent to recruit supply teachers. Does the Cabinet Secretary recognise that violence in schools is deterring some teachers from pursuing their chosen profession? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I, I want to assure Michelle Ballantyne that I take the issues of violence in schools extremely seriously. But I think we have to look at the evidence on all of this. There are unacceptable incidents. But the overwhelming evidence, which was demonstrated in the Behaviour in Scottish Schools uh, 2016 report, which was published in December 2017, indicated that teachers find pupils generally well behaved and that violence towards teachers is very rare. Now, I think we've got to be very careful about the narrative that is painted about Scottish education. If there are unacceptable instances of violence, they will be dealt with. But the overwhelming behaviour of our young people is good in our schools, they are a credit to our country, and we should celebrate that whilst tackling unacceptable behaviour where it arises. Neil Findlay. Yeah, that's undoubtedly the case. It certainly was my experience when I worked in schools. However, I've got constituents who have approached me who work in our schools who are assaulted by pupils on a daily basis, and I do not exaggerate that point. So could the Cabinet Secretary give us some advice about how people in that situation should deal with that violence? 
Cabinet Secretary. The, the, the first thing I'll say is I'm going to reiterate what I've just said to Michelle Ballantyne, that there are unacceptable instances of violence in our schools and they must be tackled immediately by school leadership. But overwhelmingly, the evidence demonstrates that teachers generally find pupils to be well behaved and that violence towards teachers is rare. Now, where there is unacceptable behaviour, in my answer to uh, Michelle Ballantyne a moment ago, I said that, that we should be uh, tackling the underlying reasons for that behaviour. That should be as part of a programme of early intervention to address the behaviour of young people and to make sure that staff can come to their work safe and secure in the participation they can undertake at their work and that other pupils are safe into the bargain. That is the approach that should be taken in all schools in the country and I'm confident that that is the approach that's taken around the country. Question number four, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government whether it considers that enough has been done to address workforce concerns regarding helicopter safety in the North Sea since the disaster ten years ago this week. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, April the 1st marks 10 years since the tragic Super Puma accident off the Peterhead coast with a loss of 16 lives and uh, our thoughts, I'm sure those of colleagues in the chamber, are with all those who lost a loved one in that tragic event. A range of work has been undertaken by the Civil Aviation Authority, trade unions and industry, developing and implementing a range of safety measures since this tragedy, including workforce engagement review led by Oil & Gas UK involving unions and industry. The CAA will also carry out a post-implementation review of their safety review of offshore helicopter operations, the CAP1145, undertaken by an independent CAA team with engagement with key stakeholders, including trade unions. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. The Minister will know that since that disaster 10 years ago, another four offshore workers lost their lives off Shetland in 2013, and another 13 lives were lost in the Norwegian sector in 2016. Now, the fatal accident inquiry on the Peterhead clash found that it was preventable, and at the same, much the same time, the Transport Select Committee of the House of Commons acknowledged the case for an inquiry looking at the commercial pressures which affect helicopter operations. Given that the view of the offshore workforce, the trade unions, and many families is very clear, will the Scottish Government not now get behind the calls for a full public inquiry before any more lives are lost offshore? Minister. Well, certainly can I at outset recognise the, the sincere concerns that Mr Macdonald has expressed. I know he has a uh, very strong and long-standing interest in, in safety in the oil and gas industry, so I very much respect his view on this and I continue to engage with him on the matter. Uh, clearly, uh, in terms of the issues around the commercial pressures which the member referred to, that I just want to say the, the issue of aviation safety is obviously one that is reserved to UK uh, Government and Parliament uh, under the Scotland Act, but we continue to engage very strongly with the regulators ourselves in terms of OGA uh, in particular and, and with Oil and Gas UK and operators that are present in the Oil and Gas Industry Leadership Group that I co-chair with Melford Campbell. And we will continue to raise and prioritise the issue of health and safety in the industry. So it's not that we are uh, ignoring the issue, far from it, we are taking it very seriously. Uh, obviously the FEI that Mr Macdonald referred to has come forward with conclusions but just to point out that measures are already being implemented around prohibiting helicopter flights in most severe sea conditions and I can write to the member about other steps that have been taken uh, subsequently to, to the inquiry. Uh, Tavish Scott to be followed by Liam Kerr. Tavish Scott. May I associate myself with Lewis MacDonald's uh, sensible question and ask the Minister to reflect that the uh, Sumba crash that Lewis MacDonald mentioned is now six years past and there still has not been a fatal accident inquiry. Would the Minister at least undertake to speak with the Crown Office to press the case for that fatal accident inquiry to begin, given that uh, the families of those who lost loved ones still have no answers to what actually happened? Minister. Well, I, I very much recognise the, the strong interest indeed of Mr Scott and indeed Alistair Carmichael, a local MP as well, in terms of the role of an, an FAI. Uh, investigations of deaths uh, and decisions on fatal accident inquiries are, as I'm sure the members are aware, matters for the Lord Advocate acting independently. Uh, and the Scottish Government is providing an additional £5 million in the Crown Office budget for 2019-20 to allow them to continue to increase staffing in response to increasingly complex caseload. I cannot intervene in the direct decision-making of the Lord Advocate, but we are making resources available to hold more fatal accident inquiries. Liam Kerr. Finding officer, uh, Tavish Scott makes a good point. I think what angers the uh, colleagues and families of victims is that accident inquiries can take years. Uh, I think one third of fatal accident inquiries take over three years. In 2016, the Inspectorate of Prosecution made 12 recommendations to speed up and streamline accident inquiries. So can I ask the Minister, of those recommendations, how many have been implemented? Minister. 
Well, um, as the member may know, I appreciate uh, that he was not in the, the previous session of Parliament. We moved fatal accident inquiry legislation. I was the minister responsible for taking that through the Parliament, and we made a number of uh, measures to improve the performance in terms of delivery of fatal accident inquiries, greater engagement with the families involved, which we recognised was a failing in the previous uh, regime, and also to make sure there was a charter to, in place to try and improve performance. i happily uh, reflect on the points made with Justice colleagues and come back to him with any answers about steps that have been implemented since. Question number five, Gil Patterson. Many thanks, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent meetings it has, has had with ScotRail and Network Rail regarding the efficiency of services using Mulgay Station. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. I last met with the Managing Director of ScotRail Alliance, Alex Hines, in January, and I am expected to meet him again on the 24th of April this year. Uh, we will discuss a range of issues, including ScotRail's performance across the network. My officials at uh, Transport Scotland meet on a monthly basis with Network Rail and ScotRail to discuss performance issues and improvement initiatives. Gil Patterson. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the extremely poor record held by the performances of services to Mulgai, which were the worst rated in Scotland, and that and that works were progressed in order to make improvements. Can the Cabinet Secretary say if these works have been completed and what is the outcome? Cabinet Secretary. I can confirm the ScotRail Alliance implemented the recommendations from the Donovan report for Mulgai services. Uh, this has resulted in a significant improvement in right time departures at Mulgai by 17.5%. Recommendations included uh, timetable changes, platform extension work and additional train and crew to allow departure services from Mulgai to depart on time. These recommendations were delivered along with uh, similar ones within the Strathclyde area, uh, which has seen performance improvement in the wider Strathclyde network. And I can also confirm to the member uh, that more work is underway to implement further timetable changes to ensure sustained improvement is achieved. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the current secretary might be aware of some calls that duelling the track between Mulgai Station and Hindland might actually be a solution to improve some of the, the blockages in that line. Has the government given any consideration to that as a viable or worthwhile concept? And if so, could he outline uh, next steps in a timescale for doing so? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Network Rail are presently assessing what further actions they can take on the line to improve performance, and that includes looking at how they can enhance existing infrastructure arrangements on that particular line, and they will be reporting in due course on that issue. Question number six, John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with NHS Ayrshire and Arran and South Ayrshire Council regarding the reported shortage of funded packages of care in South Ayrshire. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Officials are engaging with senior officers in South Ayrshire regarding local plans to address current difficulties in the provision of appropriate care. This includes the partnership's longer term plans for service redesign and are part of our joint work with all three integration joint boards in partnership with NHS Ayrshire and Arran on making the best use of the totality of their budgets to shift the balance of care into community settings. John Scott. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer, but she will be aware that NHS Ayrshire and Arran is expected to have a £20 million deficit or thereby this year, while South Ayrshire Council have already overspent their social care budget for this year as well. What advice and help can the Scottish Government give to these two organisations, which between them are sustaining around 60 people in a hospital environment when these people are ready and waiting to be discharged into the community? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, I'm sure Mr Scott appreciates and knows that there are many reasons for delayed discharge, some of which uh, may be what are called Code 9 reasons, which are to do with uh, powers of attorney and guardianship and can take quite a long time, some of which are in fact to do with uh, the patient's own requirements. But even so, I take very seriously delayed discharge, uh, which is there because uh, care in the community is not available or not appropriate to the individual needs. He will of course also be aware uh, of the significant increase in the baseline budgets to health boards, uh, thanks to our budget passed uh, not that long ago, of the brokerage arrangements that I have made as part of our medium term financial planning framework, which also allows uh, our NHS boards uh, the flexibility of a three year planning framework and of the additional £160 million that has gone from 
the health budget uh, to uh, health and social care partnerships through local authorities in order to provide additional care. All of that said, uh, we are actively engaging with COSLA, which is a very important partnership uh, in this matter, uh, with individual uh, health and social care partnerships to help them understand how, as I said, the totality of the funding arrangements that are there. The point of integration is not to worry about whose particular budget something comes from, but to make sure that the care is provided that people need. So we are individually working with areas that have particular difficulties, including South Ayrshire, where significant redesign and improvement of health, care at home and social care packages is required to bring them to a comparable footing of their colleagues elsewhere in Ayrshire and elsewhere in Scotland.